way that we can shut all of our errors. So the last concurrence looked like that. If you want to on that. Some of the fish that come with the hatch out of those areas. I just want to recommend though, 3% of the ocean here produces about 18% of the world's supply of food, of seafood. Uh, another, another big area is out of uh, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Panama, uh, those areas. That's the humble current. The ocean out of the humble currents coming in and we And you can see it here. Now, I'll take a moment here. What you're looking at, this white part is actually the land. So there's Panama right there, you have Ecuador over here, you have the Galapagos over here. Right here is the Humboldt Current, which is cold water coming off the coast of South America, meeting up with water current coming in from Hawaii. When these two come together, there's a tiny little shelf right in this area where you see these islands. And there's lots of other islands, and the combination of the warm water and the cold water produces the largest anchovy fields in the world. Lots of fish come eat the anchovies, most of the lives of Sunday Lion Two tunas, uh, grouper of tunas, uh, monopod and swordfish, a lot of the large flagships are eating all those anchovies. So you have a of fish you have in that area. And the Gulf Stream is another one that's very productive. And you'll see the current there. You also see a lot of shallow water area, like we talked about the tidal shelves, so there's a lot of production there. Uh, oyster, shrimp, a lot of those products. Uh, and that's only about 3% uh, of the world's supply, but it's less than 1% of the world's ocean surface. And then Windsor, which is another area you allow to see food from, you have this huge uh, shelf, tidal shelf above here. This is the Georgia Bank area here. And we have the Gulf Stream coming up here, and the Gulf Stream hits that uh, upwells and creates a lot of nutrients here. There's more of the current. And sometimes you can fly into the Gulf Stream, and you'll see it's about 20 miles wide, a column of water. It's like a greenish column of water going right between all the blue water all around. And what you see is two protectors. Plus, the Gulf Stream has all these nutrients and, and uh, phytoplankton, and zooplankton, which are washing up. So as it hits, the uh, kind of shelf here is getting out, and it creates all these little eddies, beautiful places that fish love to create these uh, you know, massive schools of fish. So this is one of those rubber fishing grounds as well, and has been for centuries. Uh, about 8% of the world's supply comes out of this 2% of the world's area. So just a tad bit about sustainability and where it came from. Back in ancient history times, from local times, to about the 1700s, men were pretty much fishing the book and line, where they were using a fish off a small boat. Two guys throw throw it out, you pull it in and get some fish. Even in the 1700s, that was still a basic, basic philosophy and standard of fishing. Some of those became what they call schooners. And those schooners would have a bunch of dories attached to them. So you would have individual fishermen who would go out on a large schooner, and then during, during the day, they would lower their boats, one or two men to a scoop to a dory, they would go out fish all day, come back to the schooner at night, they would cut, drill them down the fish on the boat. Pack them, pack them on some salt, because they have ice in the refrigeration, that's it. So they pack them salt. That's where salt pot came from, salt pot. That's why you have salt fish. That was the original way to preserve fish. So then things changed. About the 1880s, the steam engine came about. So it helped the railroads grow, it helped the cars grow, but it also helped fish. We were able to get further out into the Georgia Bank, into the Grand Banks, to areas we've never fished before. Uh, and then in the, 20, in, the, in the 40s, Thanks to World War II and, and all of the work, work done for submarines and such, we developed sonar, uh, radar, uh, and Lorraine. And that really helped us find the fish a lot better, all the fishing grounds to find the fish. So now the balance is changing. Before the fish kind of had their hands more fish, more fishermen, more capabilities, but now the, the fishermen started getting their hands. Uh, in 1953, I think, it was the Fair Tribe was the first factory trawler boat. I'll have a picture on this slide. Uh, there's, it was a 300 foot vessel which would go out for six months at a time and pack up 300,000 pounds of fish at a time. And these boats was, were being built in the 50s and 60s. And they really started hitting them very hard. They were mostly Russian, Norwegian, Japanese vessels, and they would fish all over the world. So what happened is they would, they would blow up right off the shore of, say, New England, within a few miles of shore. And you could fish, I think, that time, for three miles offshore before the natural waters came. Well, that changed in 76. But first, the first fishery actually started in 1871 from the National the United States Commission of Fish and Fisheries, which later became the National Marine Fisheries Service. It was sanctioned by Congress and devoted to protection, study, and management and restoration of fish. So seafood sustainability and seafood uh, husbandry really came, came about in the late 1800s. Um, so it's been around a long time. 
the big, the big change came in 1976 with Rags and Stevenson Act, where we just did a 200 mile limit. And we said, no more instruction to reach the Japanese trawlers loading up all of our cotton out of the flounder right off our coast. And then shortly thereafter, all the other nations did the same, which then led to 1982. Um, 1982 law of the sea from the United Nations. Because all the other nations said, well, we want to do about So basically, they do a two about limits for everybody. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't format well. Like, I write this on the map, so when I put it on the book, it's easy to the uh, There's also the 1996 U.S. Fisheries Act. And then, um, so, so basically, the fisheries has been really around a long time. So all the NGOs who walk in and say, we just saved the world. Thank God we are here to save the world from you know, fishing out the ocean. Well, we've been working on this. For 150 years, we don't mind help. We welcome to the cost. But those acts like you started to think you did. I get in trouble saying I these things. Um, <laughs> um, I think I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to say, for 1,600 stores at the time, uh, we had uh, US, US food service. We were a $32 billion company. We were one of the largest companies in the world. We were very worried about the state. In 1999, we started the uh, Choice Tax Program in the Court. We hired a scientist of our own, and we gave them $100,000 to hire a scientist of theirs. So our guy worked on the farm raised stuff, their guy worked on the ocean stuff. Today, they have 18 scientists working in different issues. And now you also have Mark uh, Bay and lots of other guys doing it. But the point is, we, you know, we were there before um, you know, the rest of these guys were there. So we had a lot of credibility about talking about Challenges are aware of black hatch, impact on the environment. Uh, we have good data, we're effective at the management from the smaller rural areas or you know, the smaller third, third countries, third world countries. Uh, illegal fishing issues, uh, energy, the kind of energy you use to catch fish uh, can be an issue. Um, and then developing country participation, a lot of smaller countries do not have resources to manage their fish. And then some of the newer things like ocean certification will be far from good enough. BRDs or bycatch cuts for the rest in action. And essentially, you have this um, metal frame uh, piece there that's woven from the end of a certain angle. So the shrimp get caught, but then the big part of the world gets it, it shuts that and then gets it pushed out of the bottom. So they do work pretty effectively to put the device in the water. Uh, some of the other things we're doing these days are called separated trawls. So for the wind, for example, when you're dragging a trawl on the bottom, you're dragging about four to six knots. The fish are trying to ask what the net is, and they get tired, and they just try to dive into the net a little bit. Well, certain species dive down. Uh, Hakes, flounders will dive down. Uh, Haddock will dive down. Cod will dive up. So if you're trying to minimize the catch of cod in a certain area, you will just have a circular trawl, and the back end will just hop into the net and be open. And all the cod go up, they go out, and they release through these white ones. So it's one of the ways to try to be a little more sustainable with the trawl box sugar. Uh, three digital maps. Uh, we are now working on mapping the entire area, all the areas of the fish, all the shallower water areas from zero to 300 feet are pretty much being mapped. It helps you uh, avoid uh, critical or sensitive habitat areas. Uh, we're also doing photo mapping. Uh, this is a shot of scalps at about 85 feet. Uh, there's a lot of observers and data collection. In our plant, uh, every month or so, one of the new fisheries uh, folks will come in, a new marine fisheries or national fisheries service folks will come in, they'll take the fiber, they'll take the scales, they'll measure the fish. They actually look at the scales to the age of the fish to make sure we're not taking fish that are too young and last spawn yet. The fish, their, their rings uh, grow in their scales like, like tree rings do, and you can tell the age of the fish by the, the rings and the scales. And that's what they're doing. So we're on fisheries. So with all this kind of stuff, and the fact that we can now fish is pretty, pretty efficient when we fish. Right now, only 13% of the world's fisheries are underexploited. Meaning there's more fish out there than you talk. About half or 57% of today's fisheries are fully exploited. Meaning we're taking about as much as we can without getting into the principle. We're taking first the interest off the top. So we're sort of pretty well against uh, And about 30% of the over-exploited. 
These numbers have gotten better. Two years ago, it was 53% fully exploited, 33% over exploited. Um, so we're, we're getting a little bit better. At which the point is, there's only so much wild fish going around. So this trend of wild fish prices going higher and farm fish prices going lower is going to continue because we're taking about as much fish as we can take. From about 1980 until last year, we're taking about 85 million metric tons of fish out of the ocean. It stayed pretty steady for the last 30 years. From 1950, 60, 70, up to about 1980, we ramped up to about 90 million metric tons. And since then, it's been anywhere from 83 to 92 million metric tons for the last 35, 40 years. So it's pretty consistent. The species changed a little bit, everything has to change a little bit, but that total number stays the same. So all the growth, right, comes from where? All the growth is eaten. And some of that from the farm raised on the board. So we have a fire rate future, absolutely. Again, here's the world's seafood production in, uh, in tons. So you can see in 1990, in 1980, only 9% of the world's fisheries were farm raised. As of 2012, it was 50-50. These are the projections from the United Nations Fishery and Agricultural Organization. By the year 2030, about 68, 69% of the world's seafood will be farm raised. So the people out there are like, oh, I only eat farm raised, I can only buy farm raised it's, it's the spurs of the earth. It's like, the, don't eat produce, don't eat meat. Because they're all farm raised. So if you're only going to eat wild, fine. Don't get the little follows mushrooms and berries and see how they see what you can find in the grocery store. Right? Alright. Can't help it, I do have compassion. Alright, so what's a buyer to do? A buyer, you need to go out and find out what does the consumer want, and also what does the market give you. Especially the wild, in the case of wild and fresh, you have to take pretty much what the market gives you. And if you like to have certain products all the time, you gotta work with the uh, Also, buy what you know you can sell. Also, know your key sales drivers and know those key critical price points. Try working with your supplier and let them know what your key critical items so that when they are available, they'll make sure your key is available to you. Or if there's a certain price point, it's like, this kind of hit this number, I can put three scallops on that kind of plate and I can make my, make my margin. But at this point, I can't. So you gotta let this, your, your person know what those numbers are. So they can hear they can't, or the season's in, the season's out, the season's out. Uh, certainly, buy direct, buy local, uh, and not just for all those sustainable reasons, there's better quality. There's less to handle, uh, it's easy, more easy to trace, and certainly lower environmental impacts and support your local community. Um, you gotta think of seafood as different. Right? Seafood, you have wild, fresh seafood, far different than everything else. You have, um, like I said, produce, meat, everything's farmed, right? In, in, sea, in seafood, you still have wild. It's the only thing like that. So you have to have a different mentality and mindset as a buyer when you look at that product. Uh, one, you want to develop simple specifications for your farm fish. You want to have standards, not necessarily have, necessarily have the right to your own, but your standard might be. MSC equivalent. It's MSC or equivalent. Uh, it's one uh, of those other standards or equivalents. It doesn't like necessarily have the right to As a fresh buyer, your, your priority should normally be quality first, service second, price later. Does that mean price is not important? No, it's not important. It's fresh quality fish. There's not enough fish to go around. Right? So one, you have to make sure you have it, and two, it's really good quality. You know, then you worry about prices. You have to have enough price to get the problem. Um, so fresh wild fish is the most volatile. Uh, you want to build a relationship with a company like Food Free Seafood. Uh, farm based seafood is a little less volatile and then that may you know, allow for some better fits if you're going to farm based Latvia, farm based products. You can be a little bit pushed to on price, but you're still looking for quality first. Then wild frozen procurement is very volatile. Again, you want partnerships to make sure that you can supply you know, or, or secure that supply for king crabs, snow crabs, snow crabs. And frozen farm is the least volatile, and that's the one you should be asking more to buy. When it's frozen, it's flatly delayed and so on. You can beat the guys up, it's easier, easier to work with. It's more product than um, Like I mentioned before, look for it and develop spot pies. So we get a lot more items following heavy, heavy landings or fishery openings. Uh, and then you want to be more flexible, being flexible to buy is very important. Uh, but yeah, I know you want to, you'd love to have all 8 to 16 ounce red snapper flakes. You're flexible enough to take other types of snappers and groupers. You provide a lot more value to your customers. Um, high prices, our products are going to be expensive. Uh, you want to negotiate hard, but you do not want to overdo it. And that's where species substitution comes in. When the buyer's out there saying, I have to have this fish at 
So if you push too hard, you're going to start creating problems for yourself. Um, we have to accept high-end seafood is priced, which is an expensive item. So the limited supply is high cost, but it may only sell in high-end restaurants by table above, depending on the species. So when fresh wild products, spend an extra 50 cents, spend an extra dollar, and get the right product. Uh, and build partnerships, especially with your fresh wild suppliers. Uh, it's, it's, you know, today, especially the bigger buyers, a lot of the buyer workers are the Cisco's of the world, um, Costco's, I guess. For them, it's all about getting the supply. They don't worry so much about, I'm trying to time the market. They don't want to the market. I just want to have enough, you know, mommy, mommy, to get me through the season. So when they were fishes from uh, November to March, you know, by February, they want to have their freezer stocked and enough mommy to get them to next November. They're not worried about price effects. They have to have it. Because they've had many times where these come short. Red Lobster Garden, these guys don't get a crop. So that's the mentality that comes to the wild. Supplier criteria, uh, you want to hold them accountable for quality, service, and price in that order. So you're still going to hold your suppliers accountable. That means you just give the world to them, right? You still have to be held accountable for great quality, meeting the specifications you have, trimming workmanship, make sure the temperature's right, and service level of the product's going to be the reason it's going to be there. Uh, and timely communication, so no surprises. Uh, so if things happen all the time, it's only to communicate what those problems are, what those issues are, on a timely basis that you can make changes and adjustments. That's what, it, that's what a good, uh, good supplier does. And they also give you sales guidance. <coughs> Nothing that you necessarily want, but they give you different items and different ideas on things you start sales with. And also cost reduction ideas. And how do you reduce costs? By working with someone, like, for example. You want to avoid custom specs. As much as possible, you can take what the market delivers and say, well, if you say, oh, I only have to have eight ounce portions of this, and only six ounce portions of that, well, we can do it for you for the price that you buy. If you're flexible, say, hey, when five ounce lobster tails are running heavy, I'll go to five ounces. When nine ounce lobster tails are running heavy, I'll do nine ounce. So if you're flexible, you can help drive your cost down and your supplier's cost down. Uh, Larger pack sizes of it, which obviously makes sense. Uh, developing in and out items. So maybe you don't have that all the time, but for a month, we know that they're going to be running. We're going to carry this like a month over here, we're going to carry this like. And then what's called RFQ and RFP for big categories and big buyers. So is there a bright future for seafood? Absolutely. And many of these things are a part of American culture, polyculture, and Fouge is in the leader, leadership there. But if you look at uh, Asia, in, uh, in China and India, they're taking tilapia farms and they raise them with rice. So they'll take a rice paddy, they'll just put baby tilapia in it, and they'll just eat off the rice husks, and they're getting two proteins out of one crop, out of one head. Well, Fouge is doing that today. They're raising rice and crawfish side by side, which is a type of polyculture. That's where we're headed. We're headed to very culture, polyculture, this type of thing. So farm raising is a big bright future, but it's not just a big factory salmon farm. It's going to be five, seven, eight species at one time. There's some places that are working with uh, sea cucumbers, oysters, uh, different types of uh, filter feeders that will be around the salmon farm so that they can then you know, clean, the sand, clean the water around the salmon farm. So you're going to see three, four, five, seven different species raised in the same areas. So that's kind of where we're headed. That's it. So, one more thing I want to show. I've got a seasonality calendar, for example. So, there was a great one um, that they just showed for the staffers and groupers. But you may want to do this yourself if you want to do it in conjunction with a true jag. But this is a, a, a typical buy calendar that I'd like for my buyers to pack. Where you sit down and say, okay, so let me get to one of my suppliers. Or you may just take your key speech. Five species to deal with. But sit down with Fuji as your, your salesperson and figure out when is the best season for these things and then when do I want to try to target the buying. So here I just about the, the, the oranges, the, the, the yellow is the best time for the product. And it's very complicated. And quite often there's so many different areas that the products where products from. So that's why you need an expert like Fuji or so many partners to help you with this food. Any, any buyers who are in the fear of buying wild fresh or wild frozen should have this type of seasonality. 